Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this lecture, I will discuss the various theories on what caused the great mass extinction at the end of the Permian period. Geologists divide the Phanerozoic Eon, the last 541 million years, into three eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. Each air is separated by a major extinction event. And the biggest extinction event of all of the Phanerozoic is the boundary between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic at the Permian-Triassic boundary 252 million years ago. So what caused this major extinction? And how did vertebrates survive the event? Now, there are many theories on what caused the Permian-Triassic extinction. And recent work is highlighting a possible combination of several events stretched out over a hellish period of 180,000 years. The first event appears to be massive volcanic eruptions that were occurring across present-day Siberia. The northern hemisphere of the supercontinent Pangaea was a massive volcanic region with millions of acres of active lava flows. The eruption spewed large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, causing the climate to become hot, dry, and erratic. The continents had a strange configuration. They were positioned on a single side of the planet, with a vast ocean on the other side. Like a misbalanced washing machine, the continents acted like tangled clothes, causing the water in the oceans to slush back and forth on a global scale, causing massive monsoonal rains on a decadal cycle of wet and dry seasons. Now, a similar phenomenon is found today in the El Nino and La Nina ocean oscillations on the eastern edge of the Pacific. But this, this was on a vastly larger scale since it involved a single massive large ocean. As the world began to heat up, the single giant ocean became highly stagnated, meaning that the sea ice and the cold polar regions could not push down well-oxygenated water. When water gets cooled, it becomes more dense and sinks. With an increasingly hot climate, the hot surface waters stayed at the surface. These warm waters near the poles produced a highly layered ocean. Deep waters stayed at the bottom of the oceans, locking up the raining organic matter, dead animals and plants, that filled the ocean from the narrow productive photic zone near the surface where most of life lives. This rain of organic matter included carbon-rich dead animals which filled the ocean floor and was food to anaerobic eukaryotes. Uh, single-celled organisms. These single-celled organisms feasted in the low oxygen ocean floor. And as oxygen levels dropped because of the abundance of these eukaryotic single-celled ocean scavengers, which used up all the oxygen, they switched to anaerobic respiration, which requires no oxygen at all. The two methods of anaerobic respiration that they likely switch to is carbonate respiration, which produces methane as a byproduct, and sulfate respiration, which produces hydrogen sulfide, or H2S gas. Now, the stagnant ocean waters at the bottom of this vast ocean became a ticking time bomb as massive amounts of methane and hydrogen sulfide accumulated on the ocean's floor. The warming climate prevented any of these nasty gases from bubbling up to the surface, but they did not remain buried in the depths of the ocean forever. At some point, 252 million years ago, massive amounts of methane, a strong greenhouse gas, erupted out of the oceans and into the atmosphere, 
shifting global temperatures even higher. Vast deserts now stretched across Pangaea as plants died and forest fires raged, pushing more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Hydrogen sulfide bubbled out of the ocean, a nasty uh, poison. Any vertebrate that came in contact with this gas would die, even at low concentrations. Global warming, poisonous air, and a world on the brink of wiping out all the life on its surface. Nearly 90% of life died. A fungal spore spike is observed at the boundary as fungus became the dominant life form on land, feasting on the decay of dead animals and plants. So who survived among the vertebrates? Now a few dicynodonts, such as Listiosaurus, in fact, Listiosaurus is one of the few terrestrial tetrapods found above in the early Triassic, a small, squat, burrowing animal. Another animal that survived was Theraxodon, our and all mammals' great ancestor. It may have been the burrowing lifestyle of both of these animals, or their independence from the water, that aided in their survival. They could live in the desert and hold out during the long dry seasons. A few diapsid reptiles also hung on, including some early archosauromorphs that would evolve into dinosaurs and crocodiles. A few temnospondylin amphibians hung on as well. In the oceans, a wasteland of emptiness, all the coral reefs were gone, bleached and empty. The vast diversity of lobed fin fish, the Sarcopterygians, were reduced drastically in number, with a few holding on into the Mesozoic. But it was the sharks, the early Chondrichthians, that were really decimated. Just a few hung on to rediversify only later in the Jurassic. The bony fish, the Actopterygians, fared better, with a single family surviving, and the unusual Redfieldiana. Uh, family becoming the dominant fish during the early Triassic. The mass extinction at the end of the Permian set up the major vertebrate lineages that would evolve and diversify in the Mesozoic era. The lineage leading to mammals, a lineage leading to crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds, a lineage leading to modern reptiles, and one to list amphibians, and a lineage leading to modern sharks and modern bony fish. The other lineages became minor players. Now that you understand a little about the end Permian mass extinction event, uh, how does it compare to today's mass extinction event we're experiencing now? What impact did the end Permian mass extinction have on vertebrates? And what impact do you see impacting living vertebrates living today? If you'd like to learn more, two books that I would recommend are Extinction, How Life on Earth Nearly Ended 250 Million Years Ago by Douglas Irwin, and Gorgion, Paleontology, Obsession, and the Greatest Catastrophe in Earth's History by Peter Ward. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjamin slash links are found in the description below.